you can turn in your Bibles to the very last book, to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. We are starting a brand new series today. It'll take us into 2025 with some breaks here and there throughout the year. Revelation 1, verse 1. Listen now to the word of the Lord. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. You can tell a lot by the first line of a book, can't you? Let me give you an example. I've been teaching British literature all year to sophomores, and so if my son fails, that's an indictment on me. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Anybody? Tale of Two Cities. For some of you ladies out there, It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Any thoughts? Pride and prejudice. This one's for Mikey. In a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. Not a boy. I was saying that He loves Tolkien, not that he looks like a hobbit. (laughs) You can tell a lot by the first line of a book. And the same thing is true here. In fact, we get a whole lot from just the first handful of verses on what exactly this book is all about, how it is that we're to understand it, what its main point is, and why it even matters. I want to just walk you through the first eight verses. Really, I just have two points. If you want to follow along, I have the outline there on the back of the bulletin that you picked up on your way in. The first point that I want to try to establish and argue for you in verses one right there through the beginning of verse four is this. Blessed people see with their ears. Blessed people see with their ears. What does it mean by that? We'll follow that in just a minute. An introduction to the book. That's the prologue. And then in verses 4 all the way through the end of verse 8, we have our second point, and it's this, knowing is the key to overcoming. Knowing is the key to overcoming, but knowing what? You know three things. You know who God is, you need to know who you are, and you need to know what you're destined for. John, as a good pastor, is concerned to write to churches on all of these things, and we're going to look at each one. Now, I do want to give you a little bit of warning. We're at the beginning of a book. Many of you, I don't know what your background is, how you've interacted with the book, whether you've interacted with it at all. 
Maybe you've come to the end of the book and this is just intimidating. You don't even want to go there. For others of you, maybe you've brought up, been brought up in a church where the book of Revelation was everything, interpreted everything through those signs of the time that were coming. Whether you have an apathetic attitude, an antagonistic attitude, an interested or even just a curious attitude toward the book of Revelation, I hope that over the course of our time together, that you would find that this book is immensely helpful to you, useful to help you grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ, and to persevere by faith in spite of all of the trials and the tribulations that come in this world, and in spite even of your own sins, that Christ has conquered them. There's three things in those first three verses that I want to point out to you. It's a way to maybe understand John's introduction to us on what exactly it is that he's writing here. Number one, I want you to notice that this book is apocalyptic. Don't worry about spelling it. I already did it for you. This book is apocalyptic. Look at verses one and two. The first word of the letter is apocalypsis. That's the Greek word. It's translated in many of our Bibles, revelation. How many of us, when we think of the word apocalypse, what comes to mind? Apocalypse Now, maybe? That old movie? A zombie apocalypse? Or maybe the supposed coming climate apocalypse? We hear that in the news often now, don't we? Either way, that word apocalypse, it's all implying the big one, isn't it? The end, that catastrophic, cataclysmic end to everything. But that's not exactly what the word means here. Though it certainly does contain in it the notion of eschatology, that is, the last things, the eschaton. What it really means when we're talking about apocalypsis, revelation, the apocalypse is a revealing. It literally means an uncovering. That which was previously covered is now uncovered. That which was previously hidden is now revealed. That which was previously behind the curtains, the curtains have been pulled back, and now we can see more clearly. In fact, four times, or rather three times over the course of the book, John is going to say that he was brought up and a door opened and he was able to see into heaven. That's apocalypse. That which was hidden is made known. Those three phrases, in fact, divide the book of Revelation into four parts, and we'll become more familiar with that as we go in the weeks ahead. But the point that I want us to note, specifically that this is apocalyptic literature, is this. Perhaps contrary to the way that many of you think, this book is not intended by God to be shrouded in mystery. God means for us to understand this book. It's not a book where the truths about God and of Christ and His return are covered up. It's a book in which all of the glorious truths about Christ, about His glorification, His present reign, and His future return are unveiled to us, made more clear to us. Now, it's certainly the case that some parts of the book are going to be harder to understand than others. And for that, God has given faithful teachers and preachers to the church to help you understand. But by and large, when we get into the book of Revelation, here's what I want us to uphold. I want us to uphold what's called the doctrine of perspicuity. Not perspiration. The doctrine of perspicuity that is the clarity of Scripture. Listen to what our own church's confession has to say. All things in Scripture are not alike plain in themselves, nor alike clear unto all. Yet those things which are necessary to be known, believed, and observed for salvation are so clearly propounded and open in some place of Scripture or other that not only the learned but the unlearned in due use of ordinary means may attain to a sufficient understanding of them. What is that saying? It's saying that even in the book of Revelation, there may be some things that are hard to understand, but everything that you need to know concerning who God is, what He is doing and will do in the Lord Jesus Christ, has been made clear so that you may know it, believe in it, 
and then by faith do good works from it, always hoping in Christ. And so we want to cling to the doctrine, the perspicuity of Scripture, the clarity of Scripture as we move forward, even in a book like this. Well, going back to our, to our verse here, what we notice concerning apocalyptic literature is, first of all, that the book of Revelation is show and tell. It's all about showing. We see that here in verse 1, don't we? Which God gave him to show his servants. John, verse 2, is going to give an account of all that he saw. It's show and tell. 52 times over the course of the book, we see the verb to see mentioned. John saw something given to him by God and then wrote it down so that we, God's servants, might also see. Not see with our eyes, but notice in verse 3, to see with our ears, to hear what John sees. And in hearing by faith, to see and behold the truths that, that John was given, the apostle was given. And as John shows us and tells us what he's seen, there's a few things that we need to note in order to best understand the book. Number one, John is shown the same events from a number of different perspectives. Now, some of us have perhaps grown up in a church where we understand the book of Revelation, most notably beginning in, in chapter 3, as working almost like sequential frames in a movie, an ongoing timeline of one event happening after another event. All kinds of faithful gospel-believing Christians believe that. But I think a more faithful and a better way to understand the book of Revelation is not so much like sequential frames in a movie, but like portraits in a gallery. Or as Josh Ward helped me understand this morning, like a series of vignettes that show the same thing from different angles. And so just take for example... We see God's final judgment in chapter 11, and then we see it again in chapter 20. Are there multiple final judgments, or is it speaking about the same thing? I'm going to argue that it's speaking about the same thing, only it's looking at it from different angles. In chapter 16, for instance, the final bowl, the loud voice from the throne yells out, it is done. You go, okay, well, that's a good place to end the book, isn't it? But then we see it again in, ch in chapter 21, it is done. Is it that the voice coming from the throne, that is the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ, said, it is done, but realize that he didn't finish off the work to begin with? Or is it that it's speaking of the same work from different angles in order to emphasize different important truths related to the gospel so that God's people might overcome until Christ returns again? I'm going to argue over the course of the book that that is how we should best understand the book of Revelation. Not separate events along a linear timeline, but the same event or same events and truths viewed from different angles for the sake of emphasizing different aspects of the same gospel. And John is going to tell us in a variety of ways how this works. He's going to use pictures and he's going to use numbers. Now, I just want you to hang with me. I've got to get all the furniture in the house in this first sermon. We'll arrange it as we go. But there may be some things that are a little bit more technical than I typically try to do and hopefully won't do again over the course of our time together, but are kind of necessary. So I'm going to do my best to try to put the cookies on the bottom shelf. First of all, John sometimes, or often throughout the book, gives us pictures, symbols in the form of pictures, and sometimes even tells us what they mean, and that's really helpful. Seven stars or seven angels, seven lamps or seven churches, seven hit heads or seven hills. The prostitute is a great city, Babylon, fine linen are the righteous deeds of the saints, and the ancient serpent is the devil, and so on and so forth. But he doesn't just use pictures. He's also, throughout the book, going to use numbers. And when I say he uses numbers, what I don't want us to think is that somehow we need to like secretly decode what it is that John is doing. We don't need a decoder ring to read the book of Revelation. No, there's three numbers in particular that we need to pay close attention to. The number seven, the number four, and the number 12. All of them are going to be significant over the course of the book. 
The number seven is the, in the Bible is the number of completeness. Think the creation week. God created all that there is in six days, and on the seventh day, his creation being complete, the Lord rested. So seven in the Bible is the number of completeness. John is going to write to seven churches. There are seven spirits. There are seven lamps, and etc. Not only that, but we see certain phrases mentioned seven times over the course of the book, and that's important. The Lord God Almighty is mentioned seven times. The title of the Messiah, Christ, is used seven times. The one who sits on the throne, seven times. Prophecy is used seven times. The phrase, people, tribes, languages, and nations are going to be used seven times over the course of the book, along with the Holy Spirit and, or the Holy Spirit as he relates to the seven churches, all used seven times. The name of the Messiah, that is Jesus, is going to be used 14 times, seven times two. The image that points to his sacrificial giving of his own life for his people, the shedding of his own blood, that is the lamb, is going to be used 28 times, all divisible by seven. And that's important because it points to the sufficiency of God's revelation. It points to the to the completeness of his work. It points to the universality of his promises to his people Seven is an important number, but not just seven, also the number four. Four in the Bible represents universality or a worldwide scope. For example, we use the phrase often, the four corners of the earth. Now, we know that, unless you're a flat earther in here, that the earth doesn't have four corners. It doesn't have corners at all, but we use that to mean what? It means when we say the four corners of the earth, we mean everything encompassed in the earth itself. Well, that universality, that number, number four, we're going to see it in four living creatures, four horsemen. We're going to see it in the fourfold phrase, people, tribe, language, nation. Four times the phrase, the one who lives forever is mentioned. That phrase, seven spirits, is used four times. And lightning, sounds, and thunder from the throne, that phrase is used four times. There's no place in all of the earth where the thunder from God's throne is not seen and beheld. His glory will be beheld by all, universally. None will be blinded to it. The final number is number 12, important in the book. It represents the fullness of God's people. Twelve tribes of Israel, twelve apostles. That's why we read about 24 elders and 24 thrones. In chapter 7, we're going to read about 144,000. I'm going to argue when we get there, though we don't have to have that discussion yet, but I am going to argue when we get there that we're not to take that literally, but rather it's 12 times 12 exponentially multiplied by 1,000. It is the totality of God's covenant people symbolized in a number. And so in the New Jerusalem where God's people dwell for all of eternity, we're going to see at the end of the book, that number 12 is going to occur 12 times. It represents the fullness of God's people, the fullness of his promises being fulfilled in his people throughout the ages, through the power of his gospel. All these symbols, whether they're pictures or numbers, you got to understand we're talking about apocalyptic literature, apocalypsis. All these symbols, whether they're pictures or numbers, they aren't meaning to hide anything. They're meant to show us things. They're meant to pull the curtain back so that we might know what God wants us to know and live in the manner that he wants us to live in light of the gospel. And so our first point there is that this book is apocalyptic. But secondly, we're going to see there in verse 3 that the book is prophetic. He says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. John understands what he's writing to be prophetic, and he understands himself to be a prophet, one in the line of the prophetic tradition going all the way back to the Old Testament. And so naturally, John's prophecy is going to be rooted in Old Testament imagery. I told you this just a couple of weeks ago. The beauty of the book of Revelation is that it gives us New Testament doctrine in Old Testament language. In fact, get this, the book of Revelation has more allusions and quotes from the Old Testament than any other book in the New Testament. Scholars estimate that as many as 278 out of 404 verses in Revelation contain references to the Old Testament. 
And then over 500 allusions to Old Testament texts are made in total. 500 in 22 chapters. Just by way of comparison, just by way of comparison, this is what we find in the Apostle Paul's works. In all of his letters, there are less than 200 allusions or quotations in all of Paul's letters. In one letter in Revelation, there is 500. So that raises the question then, doesn't it? How is it then that we're to understand what it is that John is writing? And the answer is, we need to understand the book of Revelation from the promises made, the promises and the patterns of the Old Testament. And when we understand those, we'll understand the book of Revelation. Not only that, the book of Revelation helps us understand the whole Bible in light of Christ. And over the course of our time together, I hope that we're able to say at the end of our time, we are more biblically literate as the result of this book than we were when we began. We know our Bibles better, especially our Old Testament. And so it's a prophetic book. And he's going to use all kinds of prophetic images. Those images, that language that's rooted in the Old Testament language, we're going to see the tree of life, we're going to see an ancient serpent, plague, Song of Moses, Jezebel, Babylon, the temple, Jerusalem, 12 tribes, Balaam, priests, incense, and so on and so forth. All kinds of Old Testament images using New Testament doctrine, that is, the glory of the gospel fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ, promised in the Old Testament, fulfilled in the New. All those promises, if I their yes and amen in Jesus, we're going to get to see all of these things given new life in light of the gospel. But he doesn't just use prophetic images. He also, secondly, uses a prophetic clock. What do I mean by that? Notice in verse 1, he says that he's talking about the things that must soon take place. He says he's talking about, verse 3, the time is near. Well, what is he talking about? Is he talking about a few months? Is he talking about a few years, a few decades? Is it a manner of calculating? If we just get all those numbers in Revelation right and we add them up in just the right way, are we going to know when Jesus is going to come back? Is that what he's talking about? I mean, when we talk about soon, doesn't soon just mean soon? Is that what we're talking about? Well, we need to consider, for instance, when we get to the end of the book, Revelation 22, 21, or rather verse 20. What about Jesus' words? I am coming what? Soon. Well, that was written almost two millennia ago. Is it that God is a liar? Or is it that we need to rethink how we understand the language of soon? I'm going to argue, and it'll come up time and again throughout the book, that we're to understand that kind of language not so much like a pocket watch, but a prophetic watch. Not like a tick, 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 tick of counting the days, but rather of an understanding of the age in which we live. The language here in verses 1 and 3 describe the last days. Just like Daniel's statue, all the way back in Daniel chapter 2, if we had time, I'd love to go there, but we don't. have to do it another day. Just like Daniel's statue and how he describes in the last days how the kingdom of God is going to overcome every other earthly kingdom, victorious over every earthly kingdom, he's talking here in the same way about the last days. John is saying, we're in those days now. We're in the last days. Those last days were inaugurated with Christ's suffering and his death and his glorification. And one day it's going to be consummated at his return. And everything in between, according to the Bible, is called the last days. 1 John 2.18, he says, this is the last hour. It's the last days. Peter, Acts chapter 2 in his very first sermon, quoting the prophet Joel, he says, we're in the last days. Acts chapter 2, verse 17 You see more in 1 Timothy 3 or 1 Peter 3, how the New Testament time and again talks about the last days as not being something off in the future, but it's something that we're living in now. And so when we see words like soon and near, I don't think we're so much to think about days and months and years that we need to decode in the book, but rather it is a prophetic proclamation for you and for me to be ready. John is encouraging churches not to count the days, but to consider their lives. 
1 Peter 1.13, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake, be on watch, and be sober. Paul again, Colossians 4, 2, continue steadfastly in prayer. Keep on praying, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. That's the sense of the prophetic watch. Soon as we are in these last days, get ready. Be like the watchman on the wall, looking, readying yourself. Not so much counting and calculating the days as if it's a puzzle to be solved, but considering your own lives, that we would be blameless and pure at the coming and appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be ready. So we see, first of all, that the book is apocalyptic. We see that it's prophetic. But now we see, third of all, and I think perhaps most important for our understanding of the book, that it's pastoral. It's a letter. See that there in verse 4? John, to the seven churches that are in Asia. And he gives them a a blessing in verse 3. He says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. The book is pastoral. Time and again throughout the book, you're going to find John's pastoral heart. The same heart that we see in the Gospel of John and especially in his letters. First, second, third John. It's going to appear here as he aims to strengthen the faith of saints as they wrestle with the reality of sin and suffering in this world while they aim to faithfully follow Christ. Notice in verse 4, it's a circular letter written by John the Apostle to seven very real churches in Asia Minor. When was it written? Well, scholars are going to debate whether or not there's an early date or a late date. The majority of you throughout history is that it's been a late date. That's the one that I'm going to take over the course of our time together, though faithful and godly Christians would disagree with me. Some would say, for instance, in an early date, that John wrote it sometime during Nero's reign in the mid-60s, prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. And so they're naturally going to read much of Revelation as being fulfilled in that event. I'm going to go with Irenaeus, who wrote in the mid to late first cent- or second century, and he wrote this, quote, he held the apocalyptic vision, that is John, he wrote this in 180 A.D., He held the apocalyptic vision not a very long time ago, but almost in our day toward the end of Domitian reign, toward the end of Emperor Domitian, whose persecutions match the very ones that we see here in the book. Now, he's writing that in 180. John is writing it right about 90. So consider 90 years ago what was going on. What is that, 1930, 1940? Some of our grandparents could tell us that. He's one generation, two generations away from the Apostle John, and this is what he writes. I'm going to go with Irenaeus on this. Though it's not a hill that I'm going to die on, and none of us need to anathematize brothers or sisters that would disagree with us. But I'm going to take a later date as we go. But then even in that, if the book of Revelation is so hard for us to understand... How do we get off saying it's a pastoral letter? How in the world could they understand it? Would they not receive the letter like we do and go, huh? What are you talking about, John? John's been taking shrooms on the island again, seeing all kinds of stuff. What's he talking about? I want you to consider, first of all, that the churches to which John is writing may be in many ways more knowledgeable about the Old Testament than we are, especially Jewish Christians. There's going to be images and language that he uses that's just popping. Oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. I am picking up what you're throwing down, John. Also consider that they don't need, like us, a translation. It's going to be read in Greek. They're going to hear it in Greek. And they are going to be able to hear it and understand it in all of the vivid imagery that those words afford that you and I have to work really hard to try to convey in our English translations. And inevitably, there's always something lost. But even more than that, I want you to consider how they lived in a world and a culture in which this letter was written. And that is a major advantage. When Kathy and I first got married, uh, she discovered that I love sports, grew up watching sports. She uh, was in the band. She did not grow up watching sports. 
playing sports. She was around it. But one of the things that I enjoy more than anything is I love listening to baseball games on the radio. I feel like sometimes that's the way that it was meant to be heard. The way that, you know, our grandparents did back in the day, you turn on the radio and, and you listen to the ball game. Now, I played baseball. I grew up in a house who watched baseball often. And so when I hear the game being played or announced over the radio, I can hear the ball hitting the mitt. I can hear the crack of the bat. I can see where the players are standing. I can almost smell the grass as I'm listening to it. Well, when Kathy sits in the car with me listening to the ball game on the radio, she goes, how in the world can you even understand what's going on? But Kathy didn't grow up playing the game. She didn't grow up watching the game. All of the language and the imagery is just so tattooed in my mind that as soon as the announcer says it, I know exactly what he's talking about. Now, it doesn't mean that Kathy can't understand baseball if she wants to, though she really doesn't. Through enough work, she could get to understand baseball enough to know it about as well as I do and listen to it and enjoy it. And I want to suggest that's somewhat analogous to us compared to John's original audience. They're going to receive that letter, and because they're immersed in it, they're going to know exactly what John's talking about. Some of us are going to go, what's John talking about? And yet the more that we listen, and the more that we study, and the more that we think, and the more familiar we get, the more clear it's going to become to us. A couple of points out of this. Knowing what I just said, two things. If we interpret the book of Revelation in a way that the original audience would not have understood, then we've probably misinterpreted Revelation. But secondly, just because we don't understand Revelation as well as the original audience doesn't mean that we cannot understand the book of Revelation. That God has given us the very same Holy Spirit. That we can read it and study it with the church through the ages and we can be secured in the same hope in Christ that the saints have from one century to the next. And so what we find here is a letter from a concerned pastor to churches that are struggling in various ways. It's meant to be heard and understood and applied, even to the point that those who do will be blessed. He says this is what the blessed life looks like. It's its own beatitude. In fact, there's seven of these benedictions over the course of, of the book. You find them in chapter 14 and 16, 19. You find it in 20 and 22. And all of it is, a, is covenantal language. Every covenant in the Bible has both blessings and curses, and the new covenant is no different. All those who believe in the gospel, who believe in what God has revealed in Christ according to his word, who receive the gospel by faith and then from faith live obedient lives, they are the ones who enjoy God's covenant blessings. That's the blessed life. We just considered that in the Beatitudes. Those who reject the gospel will be cursed, not only under judgment in this life, but even more so when Christ comes again. And this, this blessing is ultimately what the book of Revelation is all about. Don't miss this. The book of Revelation is not ultimately about trying to match up certain symbols and images with present events or rulers or whatever. It's not about Hitler. It's not about the Pope. It's not about any of those things, as many Christians in the past have thought. Look back up at verse 1. What is it? It is the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation is about Jesus. From beginning to end and all throughout, it is about Jesus. It is about John in the midst of persecution with a heart that is bleeding out for persecuted churches being brought up to see the risen and reigning Jesus over and over and over again. It may seem like the world is out of control. It may seem like evil is winning, but Jesus isn't pacing the throne room. He is sitting on the throne and he's not plussed one bit. It's about Jesus. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And the way of blessing, the way to overcome this world is for you and I to see with our ears what God has promised for those who love him and are called according to his purpose, those who hear and obey. So blessed people see with their ears. That's what we see in these first three verses. It's the first point. But that naturally leads us to a second point in verses 4 through 8, and that is namely that knowing is the key to overcoming, that when we hear, we come to know, and by knowing, we overcome. 
That's really one of the great themes throughout the book is God's people overcoming, overcoming the world, overcoming their own sin and the power of Christ. I want to steal an illustration from another pastor. It was too good. So creative, well beyond my own creative capacity. But I want you, just loaning this or borrowing this from him, consider this. Consider or imagine in your mind seven friends. Seven friends. First of all, there's Emily. Emily's a good person, hardworking, solid. She's in the Word every day, doing her devotions. But you know from talking to her that she's a little listless in her faith. There's something missing. It doesn't seem to you like there's that same spark that used to be there. Or you think about your friend Sam. Sam's having a hard time at work. He's got a boss who's not a Christian, doesn't like Christians. And if Sam doesn't do all the worldly things, put out the kind of propaganda, do the kinds of seminars that his boss wants him to do, well, then he may lose his job, or maybe even worse than that. Or you think about your friend Peter. Peter's always been a vibrant Christian. He loves to share his faith. People love to be around him. But you know from his social media feed lately that he's been reading some of that deconstructionist literature, some of that ex-evangelical literature reading their stories of how oppressive their churches were, coming out of this evangelical Christianity, and he's starting to wonder if he's made doctrine too important in his life. And if the rules that he grew up living by, if those rules weren't actually abusive or legalistic. And then you think of Thomas. Thomas loves to serve. He's always been drawn to the underdog. He's really patient with people and their problems. And ever since you've known him, he's got a big heart for the lost, for the struggler. For the outsider, he just gravitates toward them and they gravitate toward him. But you've noticed in the last year as you follow him online that he's starting to post rainbow flags on his social media accounts. The stuff he's writing about now is taking a little bit of a turn and he's complaining that the church is intolerant and it's hurtful to the LGBTQ community and you're not really sure what to say to him. Or you have Sarah on your mind. Sarah has always been the most popular one. You not only went to Sarah, but you grew up with Sarah. She was in the youth group, and she was always the superstar. The adults always loved her. She was good in Bible study. She always went on the mission trip. She was up front in the choir, but what you know and what many people don't and what they're starting to find out is that there's an altogether different side to Sarah, a duplicitous life. She loves to party. She loves to drink. She loves to hook up with men. And even worse, she's not what she seems. And then you have your friend Philip. Philip comes from a tough background. He never had much money. He volunteers in his spare time in a little church downtown. And recently, the city has been trying to shut down that church. And the city says that they don't meet some or another building code, some legalese. But really, when you read between the lines, everybody can see that they just don't want a Bible-believing church there. Finally, you have Laura in your mind. And ever since you've known Laura, she's been one of the beautiful people. She comes from old money, both sides of her family. She's good to do. She's smart, athletic. She has a great job. Everyone envies her. But you know her high-paying job, and you know her good-looking boyfriend. You know about her weekend getaways. They have become the center of her life. And the faith that she grew up with has taken a bit of a backseat. She got to church, for the most part, when it was convenient. She was... One of the ones who was kind of secretly glad about COVID and live streams, and she hasn't even come back since. She's just kind of coasting spiritually. And so here's the question. You have all these friends on your mind, and you are trying to speak what is needful to them, what they need to hear. And that's going to be a long email. And you're going to copy all of them onto it. They're all going to see the same email. They can all read it. What are you going to say to these friends? See that there, verse 4? John, to the seven churches that are in Asia. If you haven't guessed it by now, Emily is Ephesus. Sam is Smyrna. Peter is Pergamum. Thomas is Thyatira. Sarah is Sardis. Philip is Philadelphia. And Laura is Laodicea. These are John's friends. And he's burdened for them. And he's going to write a letter to them. What would you write if you were John? He's going to tell them that if they are going to overcome in this life, overcome their own sin, overcome suffering and persecution, if they are going to overcome 
there are three things that they need to know. First of all, they need to know the Trinity. They need to know the Trinity. We'll see that in verses 4 and 5. Secondly, they need to know their identity. We'll see that in verses 5 and 6. Thirdly, they need to know their destiny. We'll see that in verses 7 and 8. Consider the first, verses 4 and 5. It's been a while since we've been there, so let me read it again. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. From the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. The firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. How often do we run to the practical? We say, hey, listen, pastor, don't give me any more doctrine. Just give me something to do. Notice the first thing that John does is not give them something to do. He lifts their eyes up and he points them to the almighty, glorious, triune God. This is not ultimately a letter of doom and despair, but you see that there at the middle of verse 4? It is a letter of grace and peace. And that grace and peace are founded in, sourced in, and flow from the triune God. We see, first of all, in verse 4, God the Father, Him who is and was and is to come, the everlasting Creator who is, the eternal God who was, and the one reigning on the throne and is to come. Notice, this is no small God. And so when people are hurting or sinning as, as they are in the churches that John is writing to, and as we are in our own churches... Well, of course, they need compassion and they need a listening ear. They need good practical counsel and we can certainly give all of that. But what we cannot give sufferers and sinners is a puny God. A God that weeps with them and enters into their suffering and sure wishes he could do something with it, but at least he'll be a comforting, a comforter to them. No, they need a God that is almighty, powerful, and sovereign over all things. And even in the bad things that he allows in their life can turn it for good. They need that kind of God. It's the kind of God we need to give to one another. And so though our instincts may be to run to the practical, and that's not a bad thing, I wonder if we might follow or how often we do follow John's example. When we're helping our brothers and sisters with their own sin or or helping them through their own suffering for the gospel's sake, trying to encourage them, do we begin with a big God and remind them of who he is? But notice, secondly, there in verse 4, the second half of verse 4, we have God the Holy Spirit. You say, where is he? I don't see him. I see seven spirits, but I don't see the Holy Spirit. It says, seven spirits who are before the throne. The same phrase is going to be used in chapter 4, verse 5. You can look at that. Chapter 4, verse 5. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. Turn over to chapter 5, verse 6. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Who are the seven spirits? What John is doing here and in chapter 4 and in chapter 5 is he is coupling together prophecies from both Zechariah 4 and Isaiah 11. In Zechariah 4... Zechariah is given a vision of an angel, and that angel shows the prophet a vision of a golden lamp with seven branches. That's a menorah. He sees this sevenfold lamp, and this is what the angel says, not by might or by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And so this vision, it's elaborate when it's given to Zechariah. There's There's a never-ending supply of oil feeding in the lamp so that it always stays lit. And what we're supposed to see is it is limitless and undiminished in its power. And so is the Holy Spirit in accomplishing God's purposes on earth. In Isaiah 11, I want you to consider this, Isaiah 11. You can go there with me if you like, but you don't have to. I'm just going to read it to you for the sake of time. Here in Isaiah 11, we have what we see as a sevenfold Spirit of God I'm going to read it to you. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Many commentators have noted the sevenfold nature of the spirit here in Isaiah 11. He is the spirit of the Lord, of wisdom, of understanding, of counsel, of might, of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. Sevenfold spirit of the Lord. 
And so the expectation of the Messiah in Isaiah 11 is that he would be anointed with the Spirit in such superabundance that he would be empowered by the sevenfold Spirit to accomplish all of God's redemptive purposes. And so the seven spirits there in verse 4 correspond to the seven churches. They are representative of the visions given to Zechariah and Isaiah. That is that the sevenfold Holy Spirit would be poured out by the Messiah to help him save his church completely. Remember what the number seven is? It's the number of completion. That he will save us to the uttermost. Praise be to God. And he'll do so through his Holy Spirit. And we see there in verse five, God the Son. And notice there's three descriptions and all the descriptions are taken from Psalm 89, which is a messianic psalm. Remember what I said? All those Old Testament references all of them here in verse 5 are from Psalm 89. It says he's a faithful witness. That he is the firstborn of the dead. And he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. By faithful witness, it means, as you may recall, that Jesus came to bear witness to the truth, even at the cost of his own life. He bears witness not only of God's truth to us, but he bears witness as the great high priest of who we are as the forgiven elect of God to his Father. He is the witness that bears witness to the Father when the enemy would accuse. He is the one to the Holy Spirit that bears witness to our very own souls of the truth of the gospel when Satan would seem to be an accuser of the brethren. He is the one that speaks the truth to us by his spirit and his word. He is the faithful witness, but secondly, he is firstborn of the dead. He is the first fruits. All of us will follow him in his resurrection. And by virtue of being the firstborn, that doesn't mean he was created. What it means is that he has all of the rights of the firstborn son in a kingdom. The kingdom is his. So naturally, he's the ruler, third of all, of the kings of the earth. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. All three phrases in verse 5, as I said, come from Psalm 89. And Psalm 89 is giving John the words and the imagery to describe Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the first fruits, the firstborn rather and the ruler of the kings of the earth. And if you're a Christian, then you know all that to be true. But John, as a good pastor, knows that you need to hear it again. Just like every church needs to hear it again and again and again. That's why he starts his letter that way. So why start the letter here? Because the most important thing about you and me is what we think about God. It's about what comes into our mind when we think about God. We may talk about church, we may talk about ministry, we may talk about faith or good works. We talk about spiritual disciplines and more. All those are good things. But how often do we talk about God, who he is, who's revealed himself to be in his word, in his creation and in Christ? Well, John is going to talk about their hurts and the struggles and the pain. He's going to get to that in just a minute. But before he gets to that, he starts by telling them to look out for themselves and to look up. You need a fresh reminder of the unchanging God who created you and who redeemed you in Christ. That's your North Star, is the doctrine of God. But secondly, you not only need to know the Trinity, you need to know your identity in verses 5 and 6. Notice, first of all, Jesus loves us. You see that there? To him who loves us, and it's a particular kind of love. It's not talking about God's love for all people everywhere, though that's certainly a biblical idea. It's speaking about Jesus' particular love, his exclusive love, the kind of love that a husband has for his wife, who he laid his life down for. This Jesus, his son, loves his church. He loves us, and he loves you. There is no greater higher or more profound truth for any one of us in this room to know than this. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Do you believe that? With all of your sin, of all of your rebellion, of all the indwelling trans sin that leads to transgression and doubt and unbelief and fear, do you believe Jesus loves me? Will you believe your feelings? Will you believe what your heart, which is deceitful, will tell you in any given moment? Or will you believe, verse 5, him who loves us? He loves us. And how can we know? What's the evidence of that? 
Well, secondly, Jesus has freed us. He has freed us from our sins by his blood. He has not only freed us from the penalty of sin, that is, you can have a completely different destiny in Christ, but he has freed us from the very power of sin. You can be a totally different person in Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. And not only has he freed us, but he has remade us. He's made us a kingdom, priests to God, whereas once we were not a people, now we are a people. Not just a people, but a kingdom and priests to his God and Father. It's the language of Exodus 19. And it means, what it means is that he has made us to be holy. He has made us for himself. That's why he ultimately explodes in praise, thinking about the love of Jesus and his sacrificial life and of his work to make us a kingdom for praise. He says, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That doxology only belongs to God. And here he applies it to the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior or Redeemer, or King. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. He has remade us. So there's two important questions in our life. Who is God? And who are we? We counsel our friends or we discipline our children. We can't simply say, don't do that bad thing. Or, you go do this good thing. That may be true. It's got to be more than that. If we're following John's example, it looks something like this. This is who you are in Christ. This is who you are in Christ. You are one who belongs to God, who is beloved. That is the banner over your head. God doesn't call you by your sin. He calls you his beloved son beloved daughter because you're in Christ. How often when we battle against our own sin and our own unbelief in the face of sufferings, do we need saints to come alongside us and not say, do this, don't do that, but we need saints that are going to say, this is who you are in Christ. Remember the gospel. Remember who God is. Remember what he's done for you in Christ. Remember who you are, a kingdom, citizen, and a priest unto God. That in Christ you are loved. In Christ you are free. Free from the penalty and the power of sin. In Christ you are a new person and you are a different person. That, Josh, isn't that what we've been talking about every Wednesday night at verse by verse? Why do we have to talk about it every single week? Because we're dumb and we forget it. You need to come out, 7.30. Let's talk about it. We're in Romans 7 now. This was a real letter sent and explained to real people just like you and me. And according to John, this was their greatest danger. You forget who God is and you forget who you are. So that's how he begins his letter. Here's your God and here's who you are in Christ. Oh, what if that was the starting point of our ministry to one another, of our discipling of one another, of our instructing of our kids as they're brought to repent and believe in the gospel Oh, what difference would that make? Because the truth is, all good biblical counseling begins there, doesn't it? Do you know who God is? Do you know who you are? We've got to be able to answer those questions. But thirdly and finally, he says, you need to know your destiny. Verse 7, he says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. And even those who pierced him in all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Here he's combining prophecies from Daniel 7 and Zechariah 12. And really it has a twofold fulfillment. We see its first fulfillment all the way back in the Gospel of John, John 19. And it's the same prophecy that's used to speak about the Messiah's suffering, his death on the cross. But here, John, though he applied it to Christ's suffering in John 19 in his Gospel, does not apply it to his suffering here. He applies it to his second coming. And that's the way prophetic literature works. It's kind of like when you drive up on a mountain range when you're going into Colorado, you know what I'm talking about? And you go, wow, look at that gigantic mountain. And then when you get closer, what you find is the mountain range goes like this. Whoop! That it wasn't just one mountain. There were multiple mountains. And one was near and one was far. And that's the way the prophecy in the Bible often works. There's a sooner fulfillment and immediate fulfillment. And that fulfillment anticipates a second fulfillment. And the same thing is true with Daniel 7 and Zechariah 12, specifically Zechariah 12. 
But Zechariah 12 speaks of those who will wail on account of the Savior. And John uses it twice, one in John 19 and one here. And here he sees that second mountain range, that second fulfillment. And it's not the weeping of the Savior in his humanity, but what he sees here is the weeping of humanity at the return of the Savior. Of all those who have rejected his gospel, it's the weeping and the wailing of regret. There's no more chances. That time has passed. And all of the patience that was stored up has run out. God has come to judge. So naturally, he follows this judgment passage with a reminder, not from his own words, but from God himself. He says this, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. I am the beginning and the end. The Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. I am the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Wherever there has been a beginning, whether to the creation or whether to our own salvation, Christ has been at the beginning and he will see it to the end. I am the Alpha and I am the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. What is meant to be taken from all of this? That the God who began a good work in you will bring it to completion the day of Christ Jesus. That the God who started this plan in motion is going to bring it to completion and consummation when his son returns to put all things to right. That the same church that is still navigating through judgment and persecution and wrestling against their own indwelling sin will overcome this world by their faith when he returns and our faith will be vindicated in that day. That is what we hope for. And how is he going to do it? Not only because he is the end, but because he's almighty, limitless in power. All that God wills, he will and can accomplish. There is nothing that he plans that he will not do. God is not like us. He does not overpromise and underdeliver. You and I overpromise and underdeliver because we're liars and we're weak. God is not like a man that he should lie, and he is not weak like a man that he should not keep his promises. He will keep every last one. And so he says, you overcome. You hang in there. Oh, I know your sin seems all around you and it's destructive. Repent and turn from it because remember how glorious and good and gracious your God is. Oh, I know that you're suffering for the gospel's sake and the hard decisions that you're having to make and the relationships that you've lost and the scorn that you've experienced. Oh, I know that's so hard. I sympathize with you. John says, I'm on, a, I'm on an island. I know exactly how you feel, but listen, let's not commiserate over our sufferings. Let's look to God. Let's look to the triune God and let's remember who we are in Christ. Friends, that is what revelation is all about. And so my goal over the course of the, however long this takes, between now and when Jesus returns, wouldn't that be awesome? It's fourfold. Number one, week in and week out, I don't know any other way to preach the book of Revelation because it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Is that week in and week out that we would exalt the name of the risen, reigning, and returning Christ If we're not going to preach Christ, we need to go home. Secondly, that I would be able, by God's grace, to somehow demystify this letter for some of you. That you would be freed with the help of the Spirit of God to not only hear it and believe it, but to do what is written in it, and that you would be blessed as a result. Secondly, or thirdly, my aim in preaching through this book is to help you better understand your Bible, that as you read the book of Revelation, that you would have Revelation in one hand and your Old Testament in the other, not Revelation in one hand and your newspaper in the other. The best way to understand Revelation is not by interpreting it through the front page, but it's to interpret it through the Spirit-inspired Old Testament. My fourth and my final that I can't remember. I should have wrote them down. I did. They're on Facebook. You can look there. 
is really this. Is that by the end of this, there's not going to be a single one of you that continues to call this book Revelations. It is the revelation of Christ. Pray with me.